Now, this chapter that we looked at last time begins with this emphasis of desiring the milk of the word. He says that just like a newborn babe would desire true milk, that we as newborn babes in Christ, and of course when a person is born again, it is a new life. It is a new birth. Now, it may be that you've been uh, for years um, saved, and certainly we ought not to be babies. If we've been saved for years, we ought to be mature in the faith. But there's one thing that you never quit doing as a Christian is you never should quit growing. Now, obviously, there's a point where you quit growing and, and really illustrated somewhat in your own physical life. You get to a place where you've reached, you got as tall as you're going to get. And we say, well, you're done growing. But you know as well as I do, we don't quit growing at that point, right? We start going horizontally. Well, as a Christian, we do reach a point where we are sound in the faith. We're somewhat grounded. We've reached a point where maybe there was a, a quick growth, and we grasp on to the, to the basics of the Christian life. But there never ought to be a time where we don't continually, incrementally make progress in our Christian life. Because what I find, and I think this holds true in the Bible, is if I'm not growing, I'm going the other way. You never just find a plateau when it comes to the Christian life. There's no such thing as a plateau. You either are constantly climbing by God's grace, by God's help, by His power, or you're on that incline, and if you're not going up an incline, you go down an incline. So I need to make progress. Now this chapter, the first part we talked about, and introduce this, but then notice specifically how practical in the second part of this chapter. In verse 9, it says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Now, he takes the analogy here, and he looks back, and of course he's speaking here to the strangers that are scattered throughout. There's a Jewish emphasis in the book of First Peter, but the emphasis, of course, now is not to the Jew, but to believers, though many of them are probably Jewish believers. So no doubt the Jewish believer would have in his mind his position as a Jew before Jesus came and fulfilled the law, the position of the Jewish nation back in the Old Testament. What were they but a chosen nation, God's chosen people? They were also to be a royal nation. That is, God said the king was going to come through Israel. They were certainly called to be a peculiar people as Jews in the Old Testament. So he now takes that principle, the testimony of God, to the Gentiles, the Jewish nation, and he says now it's not a geographical nation, it's not a racial group, it's not a certain ethnic group, but rather it is a group of people that have been called in Jesus Christ to be a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. From all nations and peoples, God has brought people in and, and we are put in this great body called the church. Now, he, he talks about the fact that we're peculiar, and here's why in verse 9, that we should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, how are we, as we're growing as a Christian, obviously part of that is personal. Part of that is I want to grow closer to the Lord. I want to know him better. I want to walk with him in a closer way. I want to uh, be able to be helped in my time of trouble. I want to have peace through the storm. Certainly there is tremendous benefit from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, and those benefits are innumerable. Now, when a person is confronted with the gospel, I don't know that I could explain to a lost man the benefits of salvation and that appeal to him. I'm not sure that a lost man really understands what it means when I say you can have the peace that passes all understanding. I don't really know that a lost man really is uh, all that gripped by the fact that Jesus Christ loved you so much that he died for you. Not that it doesn't mean anything, but I'll tell you what grips a lost man. He realizes he's lost, he's headed for judgment, and there's a way that his sins can be forgiven. He's reproved of his sin, of his righteousness, and his judgment. Well then, under that conviction, under recognizing that he deserves judgment, that there's a way that sin can be forgiven, he steps in, he receives Jesus, but then you begin to realize something you didn't realize before. He does give the peace that passes all understanding. Then you understand not from somebody explaining it, but from experience, wow, he does give joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
man, he is with me in my difficulties and my trials. So there is a personal aspect to knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, but then there's a Godward aspect, which really is more important. Do you know why God saved me? He saved me to bring him glory. Now, God's not on an ego trip. That's an understatement. He's not saying, well, you know, I'm missing out on this, and I need some folks to glorify me. He didn't have to create me to begin with. But whatever God does is right. And it is an eternal vacuum of justice and right that God would receive glory. Now, he's in charge of this thing. He's overall. If God didn't make it happen, nobody would. And God says, here's what's right. Man that was created by God ought to give him glory. Now, God is glorified, certainly, when the sinner comes to Jesus. That's why the devil fights it so much. That's why the devil would try to convince a lost man to wait just one more day, one more Sunday, uh, just till you get a little older. Just give it some thought, because the devil knows there's 10,000 ways you could die and go to hell before you ever got to that next point. He does not want you to come to Christ because it glorifies God the moment you trust Jesus and one is snatched from the burning, God get, gets glory for saving a soul. But you know what brings God glory as well? It's what he's talking about right here, that we might show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, how do we show forth those praises? Well, he talks about a couple of those things here. The, the walk of the believer to give praises to God. You know, it's interesting today, that word praise is used very loosely. Praise is very much a, a subjective term in people's minds. In fact, praise, most of the time in religious language today, when people talk about the praise team and the praise music, and I just love to praise God, a lot of times when you get a little further and you say, well, you know, why do you choose that? Well, man, I like it. Well, there's nothing wrong that you and God get on the same plane and you're glad that you're giving him glory. Don't misunderstand me. I love coming to church. I enjoy being here. I enjoy thinking that I'm obeying God. I like fellowshipping with believers. I enjoy studying the Bible. I'm not saying that we don't enjoy those things. But my first and foremost motive is not what I enjoy. It is what brings Him glory. See, praise is not a subjective, self-focused thing. We're to show forth the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. That means that what I'm to do is to focus on, say, how do I praise God? Praising God, first and foremost, the best way to do it is with your life. See, a changed life brings praise to God. Now, I'm not belittling the fact that the Bible says in the book of Psalms, again and again, especially in the last chapter, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Now, I have breath, and I can use it to praise God. Now, God is certainly glorified that I use my voice to praise Him. But again, how do I use that voice? Well, I might use that voice certainly to say glory to God. By the way, there's nothing wrong with saying glory to God. Amen. But you know, isn't it remarkable that, and I, I hate to, to see this happen, and I, and I certainly don't want to be a judge when it takes place, but I've walked away before from services where I wondered when a person was very loud in their praise and very uh, um, obnoxious in it, I almost wondered, were they trying to get attention to themselves? I, I, I've given you the illustration before. I saw a guy pick up a plant and run around the whole church and, and put it back on the platform. Now, again, that guy might have loved Jesus more than I do, might not have thought a thing. I'm not judging him, but I did walk away, and I remember that. I don't remember a thing that got preached on that night, nor do I remember the song, okay? So you could, in the sense of saying, calling it praise, actually draw complete attention to yourself, could you? However, don't belittle and throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and say, well, you know, uh, I just don't, you ever, never say a peep. I've got breath. I can say praise God. There's nothing wrong with that. Praise the Lord. It's all, the Bible's full of it. Hallelujah. And in fact, when we get to heaven, it, it seems clear there's going to be quite a bit of it that takes place. Amen. So certainly, if my focus is with my breath to praise God, that's, that's accurate. We know that songs can praise God. But again, if I violate a scriptural principle in my song, if I take the world's music, for instance, and God says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, I take that principle and say, well, that may be in there, but I like this. Well, I may like it, 
But the thing is, is God praised by violating what he said don't do. So I can certainly praise, but the praise ought to focus on him. Show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, I notice a couple of things. When I'm looking at this, I notice the character that God says gives us the ability to praise God. The character, it's innate, it's we're, we're holy, we're peculiar, and we show forth the praises. You know, the world misunderstands this, and I understand why they do. It actually is, a, 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 in a sense, it demonstrates the power of God of why they understand. You know, you go to a lost man and you say, look, you're lost, you're going to die and go to hell, you need to do something about it. Well, if I don't give them the gospel clearly, what does a lost man think he needs to do? He needs to change his life, right? I mean, okay, I have to admit, you're right. Boy, I live terrible, and I know probably judgment's coming, and I'm bothered by it, so I need to go to church. I need to quit cussing. I need to quit drinking. I need to make, you know, hang around with the wrong crowd. Why does a person conclude that if he did those things, he would be a Christian? Because traditionally, God has changed people's life, and when he changed their lives, they started going to church, they quit drinking, they quit cussing, they start hanging around with a better crowd. Their lives are different. They put two and two together, and they say, well, evidently, when a person's life is different, they become a Christian. What they don't understand is that's not how it happens. You become a Christian just as you are, right where you are. you got nothing to offer God anyway. If you tried to turn over a new leaf, that wouldn't impress him. You say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross, cross I cling. I come just like I am, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Amen. That's what the hymn is talking about. And when you come to him in humility, confess Jesus with your mouth, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, well, that's not just a religious act. That's not just a resolution. It is a miracle. Amen. God says, okay, Amen. you just stepped in. You just took me at my word. You just claimed the promise of God. God, heaven would crumble, and God would cease to be God if he lied. Right. Titus 1, 2, God cannot lie. You have now received Jesus as your Savior, and God came and moved inside of you. You have become indwelt by the Holy Ghost. Well, now something's going to happen. However, I still have this old flesh hung on me. Now, he can begin to take this flesh and mold it and make it different, give you new desires. He doesn't make us perfect on the outside. He makes us perfect on the inside. The part of me that's saved, it's sinless. The born-again part of me that Jesus saved, my spirit, my soul... According to 1 John 3, cannot commit sin. Right. This old outside has some trouble sometimes. Amen. So God gets glory when the same old outside, the same old part of me that used to be, it looks the same way. I mean, I might be a little older or a little different, but that's the person that I saw before acts differently. Not because I have the power to do it, but because God has changed me. Amen. God did something to my character and he calls us strangers and pilgrims. You know, you're not a pilgrim till first you become a stranger. Right. See, you're a stranger because you're no longer connected to this world. You know, the Bible says in Philippians 3, our conversation, and of course conversation doesn't mean just talking. Back in, in, in the days of the Bible, it talks about your lifestyle, but specifically, this is the idea of your citizenship. I have moved from being a citizen of this earth to a citizen of heaven. Amen. Our conversation is in heaven from whence. That means from where? From whence I also look for the Savior. He really says, even though I'm walking this earth right now, that I have a position in the heavenlies where I'm waiting for Jesus to come. I mean, I've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That is a position. Now, I know we're speaking about, in a sense, uh, an academic position that we can't get our arms around. We believe it because God revealed it. But the fact that that exists, the fact that that foundation has been laid is the platform from which I can launch into a holy life. Hey, I'm, I'm in Jesus. Jesus is in me. There's, there's grace for every need. There's sufficiency in God for me to do right. And so the character is inherent. But let me move on. He talks about specifically our conduct. Look into verse 11. 
Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Now, we're already, uh, we know he's called us forth. We're, we're in that position. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. You know, I had a guy I went to college with, believe it or not, who uh, told me that he believed that you could eradicate the sin nature. And he quoted for me uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, I did, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, see, I pray that he sanctify you wholly, and that doesn't mean H-O-L-Y, it's the W-H-O-L-L-Y, completely. And he said, see, you know, and, and he himself, I said, well, you know, what about you? You've been, oh, yes, I've been completely sanctified, which meant I don't sin. Now, I knew the guy. I was his hall leader, and I'm going to tell you something. He sinned, all right? I had to go in and check his room job. Nobody right with God would have left it that dirty, right? I mean, no, no, obviously, he was a good kid. I liked him, but the man really was thinking to himself, Oh, I'm completely sinless. If I could be, if I could reach a sinless stage on this earth as a Christian, God would not exhort me to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. He would say, get rid of your flesh. He would just say, go through this transaction. There wouldn't be, and there's, this isn't the only one, by the way. There's all kinds of exhortations in the New Testament to do right. There's all kinds of exhortations in the New Testament to not do wrong. If, if I believed that I was going to eradicate the sin nature, God would just keep reminding me, now you had not done it yet, but you need to take the second step, get the second blessing, get, her, get that sin nature going, because then there wouldn't be any reason to tell me to abstain from fleshly lust against the war against the soul. No, you know what we have? We don't have a one-time transaction that gets rid of this flesh. That's coming. Let me tell you when that happens, when Jesus comes. So yes, there will be a time when that will happen, but God rather has set it up like this. He saved me on the inside by his shed blood. I have been placed in Christ. I'm in him. And the outside wants to go the other way. Fleshly lust that war against my soul. But you know what? Ephesians or, or Galatians 5.16, the flesh and the spirit lust one against another so that you cannot do the things that you would. There's a battle. Now, the battle, the power has actually been supplied for me to win that battle. You know, Joshua went into the uh, land of Canaan. I'm actually reading that right now in my own personal devotions. And I go through that again, and I see him go to, the, uh, to Jericho. Now, that was a battle. You understand, Jericho didn't want him to come in. God said, go in. Now, God did not wipe away Jericho and say, okay, it's clear now. Take, a, take it on. I'm going to eradicate your problem. He said, the problem is there. I'm going to tell you how to take care of it. All you got to do is just go march around the city. Well, that doesn't make any sense. What, God, couldn't you just knock it down? No, I want you to go march around the city. They had to go obey and trust. I felt like an idiot walking around this city. I mean, wh who fights a war like this? At least you could have said, give us, you know, here's some swords, or I'm going to knock the wall down for you, and you go in and cut everybody's head off. No, nope, just march around. March around seven times. The end of seven days, do it seven times. And by faith, Hebrews 11, the walls came down. God did wipe out the problem. And could God have just sent a, a lightning bolt? I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah, he's able to wipe out a city if he wants to, right? It wasn't because he said, boy, Jericho's a little tough. Might take a little extra effort with them. No, he, he could have wiped them out any way he wanted to. He said, this isn't what, I don't care how Jericho gets wiped out. This is what you need. Well, now, he could have wiped out my flesh. If God wanted to, he saved the inside. He wouldn't have any problem saving the outside. He saved the inside, and I'm one day going to be like Jesus. So he approves, yes, he can do that. But he said, no, that's not what you need. What you need is to have a battle every day that you've got to trust me for. Now, when you trust him and God works through you, then you're seeing his power. You're seeing it evidenced in your life. The drawback to that, if you can call it a drawback, is that if you don't trust him, the old flesh is going to win. You see, they found out out in the next city, oh, we'll go to Ai. They didn't know there was sin in the camp, nor did they even talk to God. If we knock the city down that easy, what are we going to do with these little handful of people? Get beat because you, weren't, you didn't have God's grace. And I don't know about you, 
but I've maybe seen Jericho fall a time or two, but more often than not, I've been defeated by Ai. It's come and got the best of me. Hey, I'm glad that the story didn't end after Ai. You know what he told Joshua? Get up off your face. He said, wait a minute. There's a reason for this. God's still available. I'm still able. I told you to take the land. Something's wrong. Well, that's what he's telling these people. Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Now, he tells me along with that, very practically, he says, have your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. I tell you, there's so much in this chapter. I had intended on making it to the end. I don't think I'm going to get there. But, you know, the Gentiles, and again, these were Jews, and many of them had been saved out of the church. But when you think of the Gentiles, he's basically talking about the heathen nations that are lost. They have no Bible background at all. Uh, in fact, heathen and Gentile are the same word. He's not saying that all Gentiles were lost, of course. Many of these were saved Gentiles, but he's saying the lost world, they are going to criticize you as evildoers. Right. You know, the world doesn't look and say, you know, the reason I don't like Christians is because they're so close to God and they live such a good life and I don't like people who are honest and I don't like people who have integrity and I just wish these people wouldn't live such a good life. That, that, they're not going to say that. Right. No, they're going to come up with some other reason to criticize you. But why is it that the world doesn't like the believer? Because they didn't like Jesus. The more I'm like him, the closer I am to him, they said, yes, they're going to speak against you as evildoers. But ultimately, in their heart, in their mind, in their observation, they're going to still scratch their head and say, there's something about the Christian that I can't explain. There's some, I mean, you think about the days of the martyrs. Here is the, uh, the powers that be to say we are going to shut down Bible preachers or people that try to print the Bible or whatever period of history it might have been. We're not going to let these Christians spread this stuff and they put them on the stake and they don't get up about ready to burn at the stake and say, God smite thee, you whited wall. If I could get off this post, I'd take your head off. They'd get up there and they'd sing a hymn. They'd get up there and they just, uh, people would gather around them and just pray and pray and literally praise God while they're burning at the stake, not because they had such great character. They hurt just like anybody else hurt, but God gave many of them dying grace to not even feel the pain of the flames that were licking around them as a testimony to God. I mean, I just see a small glimpse of that when Paul the apostle and the coats were laid at his feet and they were stoning Stephen. Don't you know he looked at Stephen and Stephen literally said the same thing Jesus said, lay not the sin to their charge. Saul had to think to himself, how in the world can a man have rocks thrown at him and be killed and ask God to forgive the people that are throwing the rocks? I don't think he ever got over it. I think the testimony affected him. And the Gentiles may say things about you. The lost world may say, uh, we don't want believers around, but they still can't explain where the power comes from. Now, He's telling us to live that kind of conduct. He talks about some very practical things in our conduct. Look in verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, under them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. You know, we are under, thank God, we're under a constitution that actually was influenced by the Bible. Paul wasn't. Paul was under the Roman government, which had no sympathy to the Bible. And he writes, of course, under inspiration of God, Peter rather, writes under inspiration of God and says, obey the powers that be as kings, supremes, governors. And he says, do it because they're such good people, right? No, he said, do it for the Lord's sake. You know, God allowed from the days of Noah when he came off the boat, man to govern himself. And God recognized it, put it in authority and said, this is the best we can do with a bunch of sinners. If not, we'll be back in the same shape we were in before the flood. If we don't allow capital punishment and don't allow crime to be dealt with and so forth, the world will be filled with violence and it'll be in the same shape. So he set up human government as flawed as they are, 
God set it up and said a Christian will be a good citizen. Now, the government may well come out. For instance, I think over in um, China, you're allowed to have one child. That's one reason why you've got to be careful when you, you know, have more than one child. They say one out of every three children is Chinese, so you better stop after two. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you have to be careful. But in China, they don't allow you to have one child. So, of course, they mandate birth control, and then if you slip up and they don't use birth control and get pregnant, they mandate abortions. Well, now, if I lived in a nation that mandated me to kill my baby, fooey on the government, I'm going to obey God. You don't have to obey a government that tells you to disobey God, and God's not telling us to do that. But sometimes they do pass some laws that are inconvenient. They do pass some laws we don't agree with. They do take steps that we think we don't think are that smart. Now, fortunately, we live in America where there's a, a, a course to take. Vote for somebody else. Stand up and make your voice known. We can say things. We have freedom of speech. All of that's included. But what if you didn't? You know, there were Christians that live in communist Russia before the Iron Curtain fell that couldn't even worship God. Now, the government told them not to go to church. They went anyway, and they had a right to but there were other things that they lived under, and they said, well, you know, I don't agree with this politically, but I'm a Christian. I've got to be a good citizen, just like Peter did. Now, you know what happens, and it, you see it take place in your job, your community, wherever it might be. If you are a, a person who has integrity when it comes to authority, you know, the ball's sitting around, but you still do what you're supposed to do. You know, you'll be evil spoken of. But the world still notices. If I got caught in a bad spot, he's the guy I want to call on. He makes me mad because he makes us look bad when he goes to work and we're still trying to take a long break. But he's the guy I want if I'm in trouble because he's got integrity. See, it glorifies God because we live for him. They don't know where the power comes from. He says um, in verse 15, speaking of the authority, so, so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, you know, we could illustrate that today by the news media. Now, I was talking about the foolish men, okay, on that. They can be put to silence many times by really somebody who tries to do right. Sometimes they'll try their best to, to have a narrative and somebody who's just taken a good stand. You ever heard them interview um, somebody who actually believed the Bible? They don't know what to do with them. They have no clue what to do. They, they get taken back. You mean to tell me you're, you're, I mean, the guy just be calm. He'll lay out his case. Um, I've seen Dr. Bob III interviewed by uh, Larry King. Um, I've saw Phil Donahue have, you know, a fundamentalist on his program and different people, and they don't know what to do with them. Because if you follow the principles of this book, you don't have to be a genius. You can put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Because I don't have to argue anything, but I've got an authority. I go back to this book, and I have an authority. I mean, what can, you, what can you say to refute the teaching of this book? Oh, well, I could. That book's outdated. I'm so educated. I don't need that. It's full of contradictions and old stories and fables. You're demonstrating your ignorance. If that book really was what you're saying, nothing but a bunch of fables and stories and contradictions, thousands of years ago it would have already been undermined. Yep. Hundreds of years ago, it would have been relegated to a museum, and certainly by now, you wouldn't even be able to get a copy. It's still the bestseller. Amen. So there's something about this book. It puts to silence the foolishness of ignorant men. He says, just stand for God. He said, It'll, you don't have to be smarter than they are. Just do right, and your testimony will do the job. Then he continues this idea of our conduct in verse 16 as free not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. You know, I read this behind somebody, this thought, and it really hit me that the way he worded this is really good. But you know, we're free as Christians. We have been given liberty in Christ. He says, don't use your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. Now, he's talking about being criticized. There's nothing wrong, I mean, nothing worse than a Christian who tries to use piety as, as an excuse to just being a jerk, right? You know, sometimes people don't mislike you because you're a Christian. They just don't like you because you're not likable. And, you know, don't claim, oh, it's because I'm just a Christian and nobody really likes that. Don't use your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. 
And, and this reminds me of the idea, I have liberty in Christ, but I have a new master. You know, some people like to think, well, I've been liberated now. I can I do just like I please, and they do the opposite of what we just talked about in their conduct. God didn't tell me that I'm liberated to do wrong. He says, you've been freed from your sin, but you're not just free. You're free from your sin and a servant to God. I have a new master. Now, if, I, if my liberty, I was liberated from sin, and I became a slave to God, what do you think probably characterized my life when I was a slave to sin? Well, sin. So now if I have that same bond, not to sin, but to God, what do you think ought to characterize my life? It ought to look like Jesus. I ought to be more like him. He's my new master. So he's talking about here our conduct. Now I'm not going to get any farther, and I'm going to actually go back to this chapter, Lord willing, next time because we have a whole nother aspect of our growth as a Christian but if there's one thing God wants us to do is he wants us to show this world that there's something different about a Christian we're not just by osmosis because we start doing a lot of good things and just live a certain way boom one day oh I must be a Christian Christianity is a transaction you must be born again you receive Jesus in a moment by faith I, God I'm a sinner I'm lost I'm headed to hell and I need your son, Jesus. I don't have power to change, but you have power to change me. Amen. And he will if you trust him. Amen. And then you have a whole life to grow as a Christian and make progress. Let's go ahead and have prayer tonight. Lord, how we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it. Lord, for the very practical aspect that it teaches us. And Lord, we all come short. We all know our testimony needs to be more vibrant. And it's a matter of growth in our life. But we thank you for the grace that you give, for the power that you give to be able to live a life that would bring honor to your name. Thank you for saving us and making us Christians today for those of us that know you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand up and sing 750 tonight, which is Isn't He Wonderful? So we'll stand, stand and sing a stanza of 750, and then we'll dismiss our service. <laughs>